Question one says there are only blue cubes, red cubes, and yellow cubes in a box. The table shows the probability of taking at random a blue cube from the box. So here we have the table, blue, red, and yellow, and the probability of blue is 0.2. The number of red cubes in the box is the same as the number of yellow cubes in the box. And part A says complete the table. Okay, the key word in the question is only. So there are only blue, red, and yellow cubes. That means when we take a cube out of the box, we're guaranteed to either get blue, red, or yellow. That means our probabilities need to add up to one. We we're 100% likely to get one of these choices. So if the probabilities add up to one and blue is 0.2, we have a remaining probability of 0.8. Red and yellow are the same, so we divide that 0.8 by two and we get 0.4 for red and 0.4 for yellow. And we're done with that question for two marks. Part B says there are 12 blue cubes in the box. Work out the total number of cubes in the box. For this question, you need to know how you would work this number or this probability out in this table. So how are they getting this 0.2? Uh, to work out that probability, you would do the number of blue cubes divided by the total number of cubes in the box. So the probability of picking a blue cube would be the number of blue cubes, which is 12, divided by the total number of cubes. So the number of total cubes. And that probability is given as 0.2. So this is how we work out a probability. And once you get to this point, there are a number of things you could do. You could solve this like you would an equation. You could let this be some unknown. So you could write it as like 12 over x equals 0.2 and then solve that. Or you could think about it as 12 uh, being 20% of the total. That's what it means to get a result of 0.2 if you divide 12 by the total number of things. And if 12 is 20%, how would you get 100% of the things? Well, 20%, so I'm thinking about this 0.2 as 20%. To get to 100% from 20%, you need to multiply by five. So the, as I said, there are a number of ways you could finish this off. Uh, but ultimately, you're going to get a final answer of 60. So 12 times 5 is 60. Similarly, if you solved it this way, you'd end up with x equal to 12 divided by 0.2, which is also 60. And uh, you can also think of it as, you know, finding 0.1 or 10% would be 6 and multiplying by 10. However you like to finish that off, there are a number of ways. But final answer is 60 there for part B. And that was question 1 for a total of 4 marks. Oops, uh, sorry about that. I'll put my phone on silent. Question two says Dion needs 50 grams of sugar to make 15 biscuits. She also needs three times as much flour as sugar, two times as much butter as sugar. Dion is going to make 60 biscuits, work out the amount of flour she needs. If she needs 50 grams of sugar to make 15 biscuits and we need 60 biscuits, we need to multiply this by four. So uh, we could say something like, well, 15 multiplied by four is 60. So then 50 multiplied by four is 200 uh, grams of sugar. And then also if we need three times as much flour as sugar, we need to do 200 times three, which is uh, 600 grams of flour. Uh, okay, so that was part A. Part B says Dion has to buy all the butter she needs to make 60, 60 biscuits. She buys the butter in 250 gram packs. How many packs of butter does Dion need to buy? Go back to the first part of the question. Remember it said two times as much butter as sugar. So if we needed 200 grams of sugar, we need 400 grams of butter. So let's write that down. 200 grams times two equals 400 grams. For these types of questions where there's three marks and it's fairly straightforward, just make sure you write down all of your working out, like all of your mental processes, write them down uh, to make sure you get all of those marks. Uh, so 400 grams of butter. And so then dividing that by 250, uh, oops, dividing by 250. I'm not sure we need an exact answer here, but you can see it's uh, between one and two, one point something. Uh, so what would it be? We'd have a remainder of 150 grams. Let's just write that. One remainder 150. So clearly we need two packs of butter. 
right? You you know you don't have enough in one. Uh, you don't need three, so two packs for those two marks there. And that was question two for a total of five marks. Question three says find the highest common factor of 72 and 90. For this, I'm going to use prime factorization. Uh, you don't have to use this method. I like it because once you get the hang of it, you don't need to worry about anything else. So 72 is, I know is nine times eight and nine is three squared and eight is two cubed. Even if you didn't know eight is two cubed, you can you know divide by two, divide by two again, you'll get there eventually. So 72 is three squared times two cubed. 90 is nine times 10. Nine again is three squared and 10 is two multiplied by five. So we've done our prime factorization. What do we do now to get the highest common factor? We take the prime factors that are common to both numbers. Uh, so you see here in both numbers, we have a three squared. So in the highest common factor, we're going to have a three squared. And in both, we have a two. So there's a two cubed in 72, but there's only one two in 90. Therefore, there can only be one two in the highest common factor. And there's no five in 72, so there's not going to be a five in the highest common factor. So our highest common factor will be three squared times two. That's nine times two. That's 18 and we are done. So 18 is the highest common factor of 72 and 90. And that was question three for two marks. Question four says the diagram shows the plan, front elevation and side elevation of a solid shape drawn on a centimeter grid. So here we have a circle as the plan view, front elevation and side elevation are both rectangles. In the space below, draw a sketch of the solid shape give the dimensions of the solid shape on your sketch. What's going on? Is this an art exam? No, just kidding. Uh, it is important to be able to sketch 3D shapes in mathematics. Uh, it does help with your problem solving sometimes and also uh, diagrams are very important in mathematics and science as well. So it is an important skill and you need to be able to read a plan and be able to sketch that or imagine it in three dimensions. Uh, now, front elevation, side elevation, that easy to understand, right? The front is the front view, side is the side view. Plan is the one that, you know, some people sometimes forget. Plan is from above. So you're looking down on the shape, uh, and it in this case, it's a circle. Uh, so what shape do you think this is? It's a cylinder, right? So when you look at a cylinder from the side and from the front, they're going to look the same. They're going to look like uh, identical rectangles and you look from above, you see a circle. So this is going to be a cylinder and we need to go ahead and try to draw a cylinder down below. Um, so you need to sort of draw a side on circle and actually looks like an oval when you look at a circle from side on. Um, so I don't believe they'll be marking you on, on uh, you know, a perfect diagram as long as you get the ideas right. So draw your side on circle and then your sides of the cylinder go down like that. You can use a ruler for that. And then your, the bottom of your shape is also curved with the same curve as the top. And that should get your three marks. Also, we need the dimensions. You can also add a dotted line. Uh, you'll sometimes see that in 3d diagrams to indicate, you know, the back side of the shape. That's if you're if you've got x-ray vision, you can see the back of that circle. So anyways, uh, looking at these diagrams, we have a side of five centimeters here, one, two, three, four, five. And uh, the diameter of the circle on top is four. So we need to put those in. So we've got a height of five centimeters and the diameter. I might just draw that up here. Um, because if I draw it in there, I don't know, it might look a bit confusing. So the diameter is four centimeters and I'll even write diameter just to be clear what I'm referring to there. Okay, so that is my sketch with the dimensions and that will be enough there for the two marks for question four. Question five gives us a grid with some shapes and it says shape A can be transformed to shape B by reflection in the x-axis followed by a translation CD. Find the value of C and the value of D. Okay, so firstly we need to do a reflection in the x-axis of shape A. So we'll look at the corners is one way to think about it and then imagine the x-axis as a mirror. So what would it look like if we 
you know, placed a mirror on this line, well, we, it would be the same distance from the x-axis just on this side. So looking at these two bottom corners, they're going to be here. And then this corner up here, that's at positive five on the y, y axis. And if we shine it in this mirror uh, or put a mirror there, it's going to end up at negative five on the y axis. So reflected, this would be shape A. And then we need to get to shape B via translation. Remember translation is moving the shape sideways and up and down. Um, so you can see we need to go to the left here. We need to go one, two, three, four, five, six, and then down one to get to B. Uh, now, if you're writing this in, in vector form, uh, this is what we call a column vector. Then the top, the C is the translation in the horizontal direction along the X axis. D is the vertical translation along the Y axis. So it's going to be negative six and then negative one. So to the left is negative, down is negative. So C, negative six, D, negative one. And we're done for question five for three marks. Question six says a shop sells packs of black pens, packs of red pens and packs of green pens. There are two pens in each pack of black pens. There are five pens in each pack of red pens, six pens in each pack of green pens. On Monday, number of packs of black pens sold to the number of packs of red pens sold to the number of packs of green pens sold equals seven to three to four. A total of 212 pens were sold. Work out the number of green pens sold. The question should be how many times is the word pens written in this question? That would be a good part A to this question. Anyway, so there are 212 pens sold and we need the number of green pens. So firstly, I'm going to just write this uh, ratio again. So this was black pens and then red pens and then green pens is seven to three to four. The reason I do this is because I have to read this whole thing to see it's just green pen. So all I re really need is the G that tells me it's green. R means red, B means black. And this ratio is talking about packs and the total 212 pens is just pens. So we need to connect the number of pens in each pack uh, to the total here and then eventually we'll be able to work out the number of green pens. So if we were to write this ratio, not in terms of packs, but in terms of pens, that might be helpful. So let's just specify this is talking about packs. If we want the ratio in terms of pens, we need to multiply them by the number of pens in each pack. Uh, so seven times two is 14, three times five is 15, and four times six is 24. This is the ratio of pens sold for each color. And now this becomes a, a, a sharing into ratios question. This is similar to those questions where you are told, you know, you have 20 pounds shared in the ratio one to two, how much does Ben get? That type of thing. We have 212 pens shared in the ratio 14, 15, 24. How many are green pens? It's the same thing. So what's the process here? We add up the ratio. So we add these parts up, uh, 14 plus 15 plus 24. Uh, non-calculated paper, so we need to do this by hand. Well, this is 29 plus 24, that's going to be 53, okay? So this is the total parts of the ratio, I should have written that. So the total parts uh, of the ratio are 53, and then we take the total number of pens to work out what one part is worth, one part of the ratio, so 212, divided by 53. Uh, that also we need to do by hand. Well, actually this is not too difficult because 50 goes into 204 times and three goes into 12 four times. So this is going to be four, right? 53 times four is 212. So one part of this ratio is worth four pens. As I said, this is a standard process to work out sharing into a ratio. The only tricky part here was kind of converting the packs to pens. But once you do this step, hopefully it becomes fairly straightforward. So now one part of this ratio is worth four pens. To work out the number of green pens, we need to do that part of the ratio. So green pens is the 24 parts of that ratio multiplied by the four pens for each part. 24 times four, that is 96. 
pens. Okay, so final answer there for the number of green pens is 96 for four marks for question six. Question seven says here are two rectangles, QR equals 10 centimeters, BC equals a PQ. Um, so none of these are on the diagram, so I'm going to write these in as we go. So QR is 10 centimeters, BC equals PQ. Uh, so BC is here, I'm going to indicate that with an X and PQ is the same, so they're both X. The perimeter of ABCD is 26 centimeters. The area of PQRS is 45 centimeters squared. Find the length of AB. Okay, so we're looking for this length AB. I'm going to use a Y for that. So I'm looking for Y. I also have this unknown BC, which I'm going to have to work out as well. If they tell us the area of PQRS, they give us one of the dimensions, we can work out the other dimension because we know that the length times the width is the area. So 10 times X is 45, therefore X is going to be the area divided by 10. Uh, so I can pretty much straight away say uh, that uh, the length of PQ is equal to 45 divided by 10 is equal to 4.5 centimeters. Therefore, if we go back up to ABCD, and BC was the same as PQ, this is going to be 4.5, and it's a rectangle, so AD would also be 4.5. And if we know the total perimeter, we can work out why, uh, because all of those edges need to add up to 26. So writing that down then, we would say uh, two lots of Y, or actually I'll just write AB, just so it doesn't get too confusing. Two lots of AB plus two lots of 4.5, uh, okay, let's write 2 times 4.5. You could write 9 straight away, but it's always good to show extra working out. So the perimeter is 26. This is 2 lots of the length times two, uh, plus 2 lots of the width. So 2AB plus 9 equals 26. If we subtract that 9 from the perimeter, we get 2AB equal to uh, 26 take 9 is 17. And then... AB will be 17 divided by 2, that is, I uh, have to think for a second, 8.5, 8.5 centimetres, there we go. So final answer there for question 7, 8.5 and 4 marks. Question 8, part A says, work out an estimate for the value of the square root of 63.5 multiplied by 101.7. For estimates, we want to round these numbers off to something. I think it's fairly clear in this example, we want to round the 63.5 to 64 and 101.7 to 100. Estimation can sometimes be difficult because there are no hard and fast rules to say, you know, round to this specific value for every number. But in this case, because both will round to square numbers, uh, they're both close to square numbers. I think that's the goal here. So 64 times 100, this is 6400. And then, well, if you know, well, you should know the square root of 64 is 8. And therefore, the square root of 6400 is 80. Um, so actually, I should have used estimation symbols there. So this is approximately square root of 6400 which is 80. So that was part A. Part B says 2.3 to the power of 6 equals 148 correct to three significant figures. Find the value of 0.23 to the power of 6 correct to three significant figures. The trick here is to look at the connection between 2.3 and 0.23. Um, so 0.23 can be written as 2.3 divided by 10. So 2.3 divided by 10 will be 0.23. And then we raise that to the power of 6 to find an estimate for this amount here. And that's where this fact is going to help us. So when we have 2.3 divided by 10 to the power of 6, we can say this is the same as 2.3 to the power of 6 over uh, 10 to the power of 6. And now we're going to use our estimate of 148 for 2.3 to the power of 6. And then 10 to the power of 6, that's 1 million. 
So I'll just write that down. Although, you know, you could just think of 148 divided by a million. How do we do that? Well, one way is to just think of the decimal point at the end of 148 and then, uh, you know, jumping back six places for those six zeros there. So one, two, three, four, five, six. I need to add in three more zeros here. So then the decimal point is uh, at the start. So this is approximately 0 0.000148. And if we need this correct to three significant figures, well, it already is. Remember, we don't count those zeros as significant figures. It's the first three non-zero digits after the decimal place that are the three significant figures. So the final answer here, 0 0.000148 for one mark. Part C says find the value of five to the power of negative two. This is like saying one over five to the power of two. This is one over 25. So final answer there, one over 25. And that was question eight for a total of four marks. Question nine says work out three and a half multiplied by one and three fifths. Give your answer as a mixed number in its simplest form. For multiplying mixed fractions, I would convert them to improper fractions first and then do the multiplication. So three and a half. Uh, well, how do you convert this to an improper fraction? Three times two plus one is seven on two. And this is multiplied by one and three fifths. One times five plus three is eight on five. And then you multiply the numerators and denominators. And uh, then we need to convert it again to a mixed number. So seven times eight is 56. Two times five is 10. And how do we convert back to a mixed number? We do 56 divided by 10. 10 goes into 56 five times. So we've got five lots of 10 and then a remainder of six. So you could write this as six on 10, but then you need to remember to simplify that because this fraction is not in its simplest form yet. So this will be, uh, well, six on 10. They have a common factor of two. So dividing both by two, we get five and three fifths. And that is our final answer for question nine for a total of three marks. Question 10 says, ah, Sorry about that, I swear I put my phone on silent. Okay, there we go, I've switched it off. Question 10 says the graphs with equations 3y plus 2x equals a half and 2y take 3x equals 113, uh, negative 113 and 12 have been drawn on the grid below. So here we have the lines and it says using graphs find estimates of the solutions of the simultaneous equations 3y plus 2x equals a half and 2y take 3x equals negative 113 on 12 the same as up here. So what does this mean? Find the solutions of these simultaneous equations. Well, another way of doing this rather than doing it algebraically, uh, which is one method you may have learned is you can find the intersection points of these lines and that will be a solution to these simultaneous equations. So all we really need to do here is identify where the lines intersect and then the coordinates of that point will be our answer. So looking at this point here, that's where the lines intersect. The x coordinate, if we go up to the x axis, it's going to be two something. Well, let's firstly work out the scale. I believe it's going up by point ones. So 2.1, 2.2. Yeah, so this will be 2.5. And this point here would be about 2.2, in between 2.2 and 2.3. So what's in between 2.2 and 2.3? 2.25, I believe would be the x coordinate there. So 2.25. And the y coordinate, uh, if we look at this scale, again, it's going by 0.1. So this will be negative 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 negative 1.3. And it's just a bit past negative 1.3. So if negative 1.3 is there, the coordinate would be maybe negative 1.32, possibly negative 1.31, something like that. So my final answer there for the X coordinate was 2.25 and the Y coordinate was about 1.32, I'll say for my final answer there. And I believe there'd be a range for those numbers, probably from you know, 2.24 to 2.26 or something like that. So as long as you get within that range, a reasonable answer, I think you'll get those two marks there for question 10. So I just double checked and the range for X here is from 2.2 to 2.3. So this is the mark scheme. They give you 
you know, any answer between 2.2 and 2.3 is fine. And for y, it was between negative 1.3 and negative 1.4. So fairly generous range for your answers there. Uh, anything in those would get you those two marks. Question 11 says a bus company recorded the ages and years of the people on coach A and the people on coach B. Here are the ages of the 23 people on coach A. Part A says complete the table below to show information about the ages of the people on coach A. And they give us least age and greatest age. The first check you need to do when you're given a list of numbers like this and you're asked for the median, lower quarter, upper quarter is to make sure the numbers are in order. If they are not in order, you actually need to go ahead and write them in order before you can find the median. But it looks like for this list of numbers, uh, they are all in order already, which is nice. So to find the median, that is the middle value. If we have 23 people to find the median, uh, the median position, we can use this formula, uh, which is 23 plus one divided by two. And that's going to give us the position of the middle of this list of numbers. That's 24 divided by two, that's the 12th position. So we need to count up this list. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 59. That will be our median position, that's our median. So 59 is the median age on the bus. The lower quartile is the first quarter. To, to get the quarter, we take the middle and divide that by two again. So to get the lower quartile, we take the median position divided by two. 12 divided by two is six. So we need to count to the sixth position. One, two, three, four, five, six, 53. That's our lower quartile. Remember the lower quartile is the bottom 25%. So everything below this is the bottom 25%. Um, so basically a quarter of the total and the upper quartile is three quarters of the total. So you can take the lower quartile, multiply by three, or you can take the median, multiply by that by three quarters, however you like. Um, but lower quartile times three will work here. So this is six times three, this is 18. So we need the 18th position. Let's count back from the, the end here. It's going to be quicker. So 23, 22, 21, 20. 19, 18, 63 is my upper quartile, sorry, 66. So I just need to remind myself, complete the table below. Yes, done that. So that was part A for two marks. Uh, part B says here is some information about the ages of the people on coach B. Median is 70, lower quartile is 54, upper quartile is 73, least age 42, greatest age 85. Richard says that the people on coach A are younger than the people on coach B. Is Richard correct? You must give a reason for your answer. This question is referencing the idea of an average. So what is an average? It's a way of representing a group by saying, you know, this, this certain number or this age represents, is a good representation of this group of people. Uh, in this case, we're using the median. The median is our average. So we're going to use that number as an indication of the general age of the group. Uh, and in coach B, our median is 70. In coach A, our median is 59. So just based on those numbers, we, we can say, yeah, on average, the people in coach B are older than the people in coach A. So let's go ahead and try to put that in words. Just a reminder, Richard says that coach A are younger. Uh, is Richard correct? I'm going to agree with Richard and say as the median age for coach A is lower. So 59 is less than 70. Okay, so that would be enough for one mark there. Just referencing the median as the average. Part C says Richard says that the people on coach A vary more in age than the people on coach B. Is Richard correct? You must give a reason for your answer. When you see words like vary, they're talking about the spread or the range of the data. Uh, so what's the difference between the oldest and the youngest? What's the, the interquartile range? Uh, that's what this word vary is referring to. So we need to go back to the data now and actually find the ranges for both. So the range is the difference between the 
least age and the greatest age, so the youngest and the oldest. So the range for coach A is going to be 79 take 41. Uh, what's the difference there? That's like 40 take 2. That's 38. And we could also work out the interquartile range. The interquartile range is the difference between the upper quartile and the lower quartile. So 66 take 53. Uh, what's the difference there? That's 7 plus 6, that's 13. So the range is 38, interquartile range is, thir is 13 for coach A. Coach B, the range here is 85, take 42. Uh, that is like 38 plus 5, that's 43. And the interquartile range is the difference again between upper and lower quartile, 73 take 54, that is uh, 16 plus 3, that's 19. Okay, now let's compare. So uh, actually I need to go back to the statement. So Richard was saying that people on coach A vary more, vary more in age than people on coach B. So vary more means that the range would be larger for coach A. So do we have that situation? Well, the range for coach A is 38. The range for coach B is 43. Actually, it's smaller than coach B. Also, the interquartile range is less. Uh, so both measures of spread and range there are less for coach A than coach B. So we would actually say the ages vary more in coach B than coach A. So going back to the question again, uh, we would say, well, I'm going to disagree with Richard this time. Uh, no, Richard is not correct. And I can say both the interquartile range and range, the difference between greatest and least age, are less for coach A. And if you did any working out there, it might be good to reference the numbers. So the range for, for coach A was 38, which is less than 43. And the interquartile range, so I sh should write range. And the interquartile range was, uh, just remind myself, was 13 versus 19. So 13 is clearly less than 19. And if, as long as you talk about the range being less for coach A, versus coach B, I think you'll be fine for the one mark there. That was question 11 for four marks. Question 12 says, here are three spheres, P, Q, and R. The volume of sphere Q is 50% more than the volume of sphere P. The volume of sphere R is 50% more than the volume of sphere Q. Find the volume of sphere P as a fraction of the volume of sphere R. Q has 50% more volume than P. So let's say the volume of P, let's call that VP, V sub P. And if we multiply that by 1.5, that's a way of increasing that by 50%. I'm actually going to use fractions here because I think it might be easier. So 1.5 is the same as three on two. If I multiply the volume of P by three on two, I get the volume of Q. Um, so I could represent that as VQ. And then VR, uh, sorry, the volume of R is 50% more than the volume of Q. Again, multiply that by one and a half or three and two, I get the volume of R. Again, the question is asking the volume of P as a fraction of the volume of sphere R. Well, if I multiply this by three and two, and then multiply by three and two again, well, all I'm really doing for, to this volume is multiplying by three and two twice. Uh, so just to kind of make that clear, the volume of Q is 3 on 2 VP, and then VR is 3 on 2 times the volume of VQ, which we already said is VP times 3 on 2. So this is going to be 3 on 2 times VP. And then just to finish this off, 3 on 2 times 3 on 2, that's 9 on 4 VP. So VR 
is 9 and 4 VP. Now if you want VP in terms of VR, you need to take the reciprocal of this. So VP then, if, it, if VR is 9 and 4 times VP, VP is 4 on 9 times VR. I can see some people possibly giving an answer of 9 and 4 there, but you need to be really clear with the wording of this question. It says the volume of sphere P adds a fraction of the volume of sphere R. So this equation is the volume of VR as a fraction of VP. This one is VP as a fraction of VR. So 4 on 9 VR is your final answer there for question 12. And, you know, just to, just to reiterate, the volume of sphere P clearly must be less than R. So when they're asking for that as a fraction of R, you know, it has to be less than 1. You're going to have to multiply VR by something smaller than 1 to get a smaller volume. So when you're answering these types of questions, just check if you're giving an answer of 9 and 4, you know, you're, you're not going to end up with the smaller sphere. You're going to end up with the larger sphere. So just kind of do a bit of a, a double check with yourself to make sure you get the you get the correct answer there. Question 13 says, given that n can be any integer such that n is greater than 1, prove that n squared take n is never an odd number. For this question, you need to know what you get when you multiply odd numbers and you multiply even numbers and things like that. Uh, so you need to know if you take an odd number and multiply it by another odd number, you get an odd number. So for example, 3 times 5 is 15. They are all odd numbers. If you take an odd number and you multiply it by an even number, you get an even number. So the product is even. For example, 3 times 2 is 6. And finally, if you take an even number and multiply it by an even number, you get an even number. Um, so for example, 4 times 4 is 16. Uh, and these things are always true. Uh, so the only way to end up with an odd number as a product of two other numbers is when they're both odd. So this is something you need to know for this question. So looking at the question again, we need to prove n squared take n is never an odd number. Well, if we take this expression n squared take n and we factorize an n, this would be n multiplied by n take 1. This is like taking a number and then multiplying it by the number 1 less than it. So for example, if you said n equaled 10, n take 1 would equal 9. So in this case, we'd be multiplying 10 and 9. I'm hoping you can see the connection between these two things. If n is even, n take 1 must be an odd number because it's 1 less than an even number. Anything 1 less than an even number is an odd number. Also, if n is odd, n take 1 must be even. Any number 1 less than an odd number needs to be even. So this expression then, n multiplied by n take 1, is like saying an even number multiplied by an odd number, or odd times even. Either way, you're going to have this combination of even multiplying by odd. And we know that that is always an even number. This is always even. Now, because this question is only two marks, we do not have to prove any of these algebraically. Uh, these are, I guess, facts that you're expected to know for GCSEs. And all we really need to say here is to finish this off, we could say something like uh, either n is even or n take 1 is even, referring to the terms in this expression here. Um, so then the product must be even. So the product must be even. Basically saying that uh, whenever you have uh, an even number in the product, you're going to end up with an even number. And that was question 13 for two marks. Question 14 says, find the exact value of 10 of 30 multiplied by sine of 60. Give your answer in its simplest form. For these types of exact values of trig functions questions, uh, I always suggest trying to remember these triangles. So there's one right triangle with angles of 
90, 30 and 60. Doesn't really matter how you draw it as long as you put the angles in and the sides are in the ratio of uh, 1 to 2 to root 3. Now the way I remember the sides is 1 is opposite the smallest angle, 2 is opposite the largest angle and root 3 is in the middle of those. Uh, so 1 is always opposite 30, 2 is opposite 90 degrees and th root 3 is opposite 60. How does this help me? Well then I need to remember my trig ratios. So for example the sine function is the opposite side of the right angle triangle over the hypotenuse and the tan function is the opposite side over the adjacent side. And one way you can remember these ratios is to remember so ka toa, so ka toa. Uh, you know, chant that to yourself a little bit, so ka toa, so ka toa, it'll help you remember it. Uh, these letters here, O, H, A, H, and O, A are the ratios. So opposite hypotenuse, O, H, and opposite adjacent, O, A. That's the order of the fraction. Anyways, now we have our ratios. The sine of an angle is opposite over hypotenuse. Go back to your right angle triangle. We're looking for the sine of 60. Look at this angle here. We need the opposite side, that's root 3 over the hypotenuse, that's 2. So sine of 60 is root 3 on 2. I've always found memorizing things like this mnemonic and this right angle triangle easier than just trying to remember sine of 60 is root 3 on 2. Then the tan of theta is opposite over adjacent, so tan of 30 is the opposite side, 1. So tan 30 is 1 over the adjacent side, which is root 3. Okay, so now we need to multiply these together. So tan of 30 multiplied by sine of 60 is 1 on root 3 multiplied by root 3 on 2. These root 3s would cancel because we're multiplying. So then we end up with 1 on 2 for our final answer. So Tan of 30 times sine of 60 is a half. For a final answer there for question 14 for two marks. Question 15 says the diagram shows a solid shape. The shape is a cone on top of a hemisphere. The height of the cone is 10 centimeters as shown. The base of the cone has a diameter of six centimeters. The hemisphere has a diameter of six centimeters. The total volume of the shape is k pi centimeters cubed where k is an integer. Work out the value of k and they give you the volume of the cone and volume of sphere formulas, they'll always give you those in the GCSE exams. You're not expected to memorize those. Although it is good practice because once you get uh, further into mathematics, if you are thinking of doing that, uh, you will need to be able to memorize these. Anyways, uh, what do we need? We need basically the volume of this shape. So really this is, you know, plugging the numbers into the, into the formulas. Firstly, the volume of the cone the volume of the cone, I'll call that BC. Let's use the volume of the cone formula, a third pi r squared h. So just making sure to use the radius, not the diameter. So the radius will be half the diameter. This is going to be a third times pi times the radius squared. So the radius will be three. Three squared is nine. The height is 10. So simplifying this, uh, you can divide that 9 by the 3 here in the denominator, so this will be 3 times 10 times pi, in other words 30 pi. The volume of the sphere, I'll call that Vs, this is using the formula 4 on 3, 4 on 3 pi r cubed, but this is the volume of a sphere, we're looking at the volume of a hemisphere, so we would want to take half of this, if we halved this, uh, effectively dividing the whole thing by 2, you can do 4 divided by 2, so you can simplify this to 2 thirds pi r cubed. So plugging the radius in there, uh, the radius was 3. 3 cubed is 27, so we get 2 thirds pi times 27. Uh, and then you can divide that by 3, so 27 divided by 3 is 9. 9 times 2 is 18, so this would simplify to 18 pi. And then if we want the total volume, we just need to add these together. So the total volume is equal to 
18 pi, the volume of the hemisphere, plus 30 pi, the volume of the cone, that's 48 pi. So k, remember, was the integer before pi, so k is going to be 48 for a final answer there. For four marks for question 15. Question 16 says there are three dials on a combination lock. Each dial can be set to one of the numbers, one, two, three, four, or five. The three digit number 553 is one way the dials can be set as shown in the diagram. Work out the number of different three digit numbers that can be set for the combination lock. You can think of this as three separate spaces. So in the first space, I have five possibilities. In the second space, I have five possibilities. And in the third space, I have five possibilities. And to work out the total uh, number of different three digit numbers, we multiply these together. This is called the product rule. So we're doing five times five times five or five cubed. That's 125. So final answer there is 125. Uh, I guess we should write something like five times five times five there for our working out. And there we go, 125 for part A. Part B says, how many of the possible three digit numbers have three different digits? Again, using this idea of spaces in the first space for the first lot of numbers or the first wheel, I have five possibilities. I could have one, two, three, four, or five. In the second space, uh, depending on what I use in the first space, I'll only have four possibilities. For example, if I used one here, uh, then I couldn't use one in the second space. I'd only have two, three, four, or five as my possibilities. Um, so in the second space, then there are four possibilities. In the third space, uh, well, I've already used two numbers, so I only have three possible choices left. So the answer here, again, using the product rule, will be five times four times three, which is 20 times three, which is 60, for a final answer for part B. And that was question 16 for four marks. Question 17 says, given that x squared to 3x plus 5 equals 1 to 2, find the possible values of x. This equation is given as ratios. I find it easier to think of these as fractions. So you can always write ratios as fractions instead. So I can write this as x squared uh, over 3x plus 5 equals 1 on 2. And then it becomes an algebraic fractions problem. And uh, I think that's an easy way of thinking about this type of problem. Uh, and then you need to be able to solve algebraic fractions. And the way you can do this is to cross multiply. So you actually get rid of the fractions. So you multiply this side by 3x plus 5, multiply this side by 2, and you end up with 2x squared equal to 3x plus 5. And then uh, we want everything on the left hand side equal to 0. And then it becomes a quadratic equations problem. So if we subtract everything from the left-hand side, we end up with 2x squared uh, take 3x take 5 equal to 0. And now we have a quadratic equation that we can uh, try to factorize and solve. Uh, so can we factorize this? Are there factors of 5 and 2 that make negative 3? Um, so if we use 5 and 1, and the only factors of 2 are 2 and 1, so we can start off by writing this as 2x and x in the first terms in the brackets. And then if we multiply the 2 by 1 and 1 by 5, we'll have 5 and 2. That's going to make 3. And then if it's a negative 5 plus 2, we'll have negative 3. And negative 5 times positive 1 is negative 5. So we can factorize there to 2x take 5 and x plus 1. And then our solutions become x equal to 5. 5 on 2 or x equal to negative 1. Okay, and that's all we need to do, find the possible values of x. So we are done. So final answer, 5 on 2 and negative 1 for question 17 for 4 marks. Question 18, part A says express root 3 plus root 12 in the form a root 3 where a is an integer. This is uh, a topic of simplifying thirds. Um, so you need to be able to take a, a third like root 12 and break it into two different thirds. Um, this is using uh, the thirds law that the square root of AB equals the square root of A multiplied by the square root of B. So the square root of 12 can be written as the square root of 4 times the square root of 3. And the square root of 4, you know, is 2. So this is 2 root 3. So this expression here 
can be written as root 3 plus 2 root 3, which is 3 root 3, right? One lot of root 3 plus two lots of root 3 is three lots of root 3. Um, so A will be 3, final answer 3 root 3. Part B says express 1 on root 3 to the power 7 in the form root B on 3 where B and C are integers. For this expression you need to understand your index laws and your thirds laws. So when you have a fraction to the power of something, A on B to the power N, this is the same as A to the power N on B to the power N. So this expression here can be written as 1 to the power 7 which is just 1 and then root 3 to the power 7. Uh, now you need to think about that a little bit. Uh, you could even write it out like this if you wanted to. So root 3 times itself 7 times. Okay, it's a little bit of work but you know if you got stuck this is something you could try. What you end up with is three pairs of root 3 multiplying by themselves. So root 3 times root 3 that's you know that's 3. So you're going to have uh, three lots of 3 and then one more root 3. So 3 times 3 times 3 is 27. So root 3 to the power 7 simplifies to 27 root 3. And then we need it in the form root b on c. So we need to rationalize that denominator. We need to get rid of that root 3 in the denominator there. We can do that by multiplying the whole thing by root 3 on root 3. And what that does is, well, we multiply root 3 by root 3 here. We end up with just 3, 3 times 27. Uh, 3 times 27 is 81. And in the numerator, we have 1 times root 3, which is just root 3. So now it is in the form of root b on c, where b is 3 and c is 81. So final answer there will be root 3 on 81 for 3 marks. And that was question 18 for 5 marks. Question 19 says, given that x squared take 6x plus 1 equals x take a all squared take b, for all values of x, find the values of a and the values of b. Okay, so I swear I switched my phone off. What is going on? Okay, I'm switching my phone off. Well, it's already off. I don't know how it's ringing. And I'm uh, burying it in my garden. There we go. It shouldn't ring again. Apologies for that. So anyways, it says find the values of a and the values of b. What we need to do here is uh, using the completing the square method on this quadratic equation to get it in this form. There's a fairly standard approach you can take here. Uh, you can take the half of the coefficient of x. That becomes the second term in the brackets here when it's in this form, a take, x take a all squared. So it's x take 3 all squared plus that 1. But then you need to subtract 3 squared, so subtract 9 and 1 take 9 is negative 8, so this becomes 8 take 3, sorry, x take 3 all squared, subtract 8, and that's your final answer. So a is, uh, a is 3, because it's already a negative in this expression, and b is 8. Just be careful with your signs there. Notice that in this expression, x take a uh, all squared take b, the, the negatives are already there, so we only need to write uh, 3 and 8 as a and b. Okay, part 2 says hence write down the coordinates of the turning point of the graph y equals x squared takes 6x plus 1. You need to understand that when a quadratic is written in this form then that is what we call, uh, you know, sometimes called vertex uh, form or you might know it by a different name, but this gives you the turning point automatically when it's written in this way. You also need to know how to read those points off. So in the brackets, if it's already a negative, the x coordinate of the turning point will be positive. So we take that number there as a positive, and this point here, that is whatever it is written as. So if it's written as negative eight, the y coordinate of the turning point is negative eight. If it's a positive, one or whatever, then it's positive one. So just to be clear, the standard form is x take a all squared plus b, where uh, a and b are the turning point. So you can kind of think of this as usually this is negative in the brackets and usually it's positive, 
or in standard form that's the way it is so if it's negative here then the the turning the y coordinate of the turning point would be negative so anyways final answer there as long as you know that you can read the answer straight off of that straight off of that expression it's 3 negative 8 and that was question 19 for 3 marks question 20 says h is inversely proportional to p p is directly proportional to root t Given that h equals 10 and t equals 144, where p equals 6, find a formula for h in terms of t. Let's write down an expression for this first statement. h is inversely proportional to p. So this, uh, this symbol here means proportional to, and inversely proportional means, uh, you know, it's proportional to 1 on p. Then to turn this into an equation, we can say h equals k on p where k is some number that we can find, it tells us that h equals 10 when p equals 6. So substituting those into this equation, h is 10, p is 6. We can work out, well, what is divided, what divides 6 that equals 10? That would be 60. 6 divided by 6 is 10, so k is equal to 60. Uh, so then we know that h equals 60 on p. Let's write an expression for the second statement here. p is directly proportional to root t. We can write that as p proportional to root t. To turn that into an equation we can say that p equals k root t where k is some constant and we know that when t is uh, 144 p is 6. So again take the same step we did here. p is 6, t is 144, therefore uh, we have 6 equal to k times 12. So what times 12 is 6? k must be a half. So then the second equation in terms of p and t is p equal to a half root t. Go back to the question again, make sure you're answering it. It says find a formula for h in terms of t. Well we have h in terms of p and p in terms of t so we need to substitute this equation here or this value of p in to this equation here. So I end up with h equal to 60 over a half root t, substituting that for p. So a half root t. And did it say, it didn't say to simplify, uh, but you could anyway, just to neaten it up a little bit. 60 divided by a half is the same as 120 on root t. And you can even rationalize, although I, I wouldn't bother, it doesn't say to simplify or rationalize or anything like that. So uh, 120 on root t would be fine for a final answer there. That was question 20 for four marks. Question 21 says the functions f and g are such that f of x equals 3x take 1 and g of x equals x squared plus 4. Part A says find f inverse x. You need to know how to find the inverse of a function. In GCSEs, I have a video going through that if you want to check that video out, uh, but the process looks something like this. So firstly, you can let f of x equal y. You might wonder why we do this step. It just simplifies the process. Instead of writing f of x every time, I can just write y. So then I can write this equation as y equal to 3x, take 1. And then what you want to do is to write this equation in terms of x. So get x by itself on the left-hand side. Firstly, you could add 1 to the right hand side and I'm going to flip it around so we end up with 3x equal to y plus 1 and then divide by 3 so x is equal to y plus 1 on 3 and now here comes a step that a lot of people uh, get confused by they don't understand why I switch things around uh, but this is the process of finding the inverse function you need to understand what this means this is saying well f of x is saying x is the input and f of x is the output, the inverse function is switching these things around. They're saying, uh, now I want to find the input if you give me the output. And, and what this involves is saying, well, x now becomes the output. So you need to actually, you change the letters. That's the whole point of this thing. So x now becomes f inverse. Um, it's just a different way of writing it. Um, so x now becomes f inverse and y 
our old output now becomes the input. So you change y to x. Um, and again, just a different way of writing it. It's the way we get the inverse function. So f inverse now becomes x plus 1 over 3. And that was part A. Part B says given that f g equals 2 g f, show that 15 x squared take 12 x take 1 equals 0. For this question, you need to see the first things you need to calculate are f and g and 2 g f. You need to find out what they are and then set them equal to each other in order to answer this question. So firstly, we want to find f g. This is what we call composite functions. Uh, again, I go through that in that same video. So if you want to check that out again, uh, go ahead. So f g, we input g into f. So this expression, g x, x squared plus 4, we input it for the x in f of x. So f g is going to be 3 lots of x squared plus 4. Take 1. And then we simplify this. So expand the brackets. This is 3x squared plus 12. Take 1. This is 3x squared uh, plus 11. And then 2gf. This is where we take f of x and input it into the function g. So looking at g, we're going to put 3x take 1 into the position where x is here. Um, so we're going to do two lots of uh, 3x take 1 all squared plus 4 and then simplify this. So firstly expand out those brackets here, those squared brackets. Uh, this would be 9x squared uh, take 6x plus 1 uh, plus 4. This would be 2 times 9x squared take 6x plus 5 and then multiplying everything by 2 this would be 18x squared take 12x plus 10 and remember they tell us these two things are equal so the next step is to say that 3x squared plus 11 equals 18x squared take 12x plus 10 and then simplify this uh, so take that 3x squared from the right hand side and take that 11 we would have 15x squared take 12x uh, take 1 and we'd have 0 left on the left hand side. Uh, so now we have a quadratic equal to 0 and that's actually all we need to show. So part B remember said show that 15x squared take 12x take 1 equals 0 and we are done. And that was question, uh, sorry, part B for 5 marks and question 21 for a total of 7 marks. Question 22 says there are only R red counters and G green counters in a bag. A counter is taken at random from the bag. The probability that the counter is green is 3 on 7. The counter is put back in the bag. Two more red counters and three more green counters are put in the bag. A counter is taken at random from the bag. The probability that the counter is green is 6 on 13. Find the number of red counters and the number of green counters that were in the bag originally. You can think about this problem as the first pick and the second pick. So we'll do uh, pick one. Let's write down what's going on there. Well, we have R red counters and G green counters. So the total number of counters will equal R plus G. The number of green counters, obviously G. Now, how do we work out the probability of picking a green counter? That's the number of green counters out of the total. So to write an expression for that, we would say it's G on R plus G. The number of green counters out of the total and they give us a probability for that it's 3 on 7 so g on r plus g is 3 on 7 i hope you can see how i'm getting to that equation there for the second pick pick number two two more red counters are added and three more green counters are added so what does the total become we can write this as the total equal to r plus 2 plus g plus 3, what this really becomes is r plus g plus 5. It actually doesn't really matter what colors are added. It just matters that we add a total of five counts in terms of the total. Um, so the total, we've added five more counters uh, to the original amount. And in terms of the probability for picking a green counter for the second pick, we now have uh, the original amount of green counters plus 3 out of the total, 
which is r plus g plus 5. Again, the probability of a, picking a green counter is the number of green counters out of the total. And this is given as 6 on 13. This is how you should start out solving this problem. From here, there are a number of ways to progress. Uh, but essentially, you have two equations with two unknowns, r and g. You're going to have to solve for r and g, the red and green counters. It's like a simultaneous equations question also with algebraic fractions. In order to solve simultaneous equations with algebraic fractions, your safest bet is to use substitution. So rearrange one of the equations in terms of one of the unknowns and plug it into the other equation. Uh, so I'm going to take this equation here and rearrange it in terms of r plus g and then substitute that value into this equation here. So just to be clear, uh, this is my first equation, this is my second equation, uh, and I'm going to use substitution. So rearranging this equation in terms of r plus g, if I multiply that r plus g onto the right hand side, and then multiply this fraction onto the left hand side, basically I'm using uh, cross multiplication, I end up with r plus g equal to 7 on 3g. So now taking this value for r plus g, I'm going to plug it into this equation down here. So I now know that r plus g is 7 on 3g. So I can rewrite this uh, equation as g plus 3 over 7 on 3g plus 5 equal to 6 on 13. Now I have one equation with one unknown. This means you can solve it. So I'm going to be able to solve this equation for g and get a value for the number of green counters. Um, so here, uh, this is an algebraic fraction I need to cross multiply. I'll multiply the left hand side by 13. So I have 13 multiplied by g plus 3 and then multiply this denominator by 6. So I have 6 multiplied by 7 on 3g plus 5. Expanding these brackets, I have 13g plus 39 and 6 times 7 on 3, that 6 would cancel with that 3. So I'd have 2 times 7, this would be 14g, and 6 times 5 is 30. And then solving this for g, subtract that 13g from the right hand side, I have g, 14g take 13g is just one lot of g, and 39 take 30 is 9. So I end up with a final answer for g of 9. So the number of green counters in the bag is 9. And going back to the question again, we needed uh, the number of red counters and the number of green counters. So we can take this value, g equal to 9, and substitute into either one of these. I think the first one will be the easiest. So if I substitute 9 into this equation here uh, for equation 1, let's write this down below. So we've got r plus g equal to 7 on 3g. Substituting 9 for g, we have r plus 9 equal to 7 on 3 times 9. Uh, that 9 will cancel with that 3, so we have r plus 9. Uh, so I'm saying therefore, uh, 9 divided by 3 is 3 times 7 is 21. And then r is equal to 21, take 9, that is 12. So number of red counters is 12. The number of green counters is 9, and that is my final answer for question 22 for 5 marks. That is the end of the paper. I hope you found this walkthrough helpful. If, there, if you have any further questions, let me know in the comments, and I'll do my best to answer those. Remember to check out Easy A if you're looking for that edge in your revision. If you're really looking to aim for those grade 8s and grades 9s, the link is in the description. Uh, anything else, you can always email me. Uh, comments, I read every comment, so anything at all, please uh, feel free to let me know. And I think that's about it, so uh, thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next one, bye for now. Wait, what is that noise? I swear I turned my phone off. Wait, that's not my phone. What the, where is that coming from? There's a phone taped under my desk, what? I'm going to answer this. Hello? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of in the middle of something. 
Wait, what? You want me to leave this in the recording? Or you'll delete my YouTube channel? Okay, that's kind of threatening. Why would I do that? You have an offer to make, okay? Put a code in this video and offer people Amazon gift cards if they solve it. Why, why am I doing any of this? Right, okay. Okay, sure. So you want me to leave this in the recording, this conversation, What's plus all the times you called me on my phone. Why? why? To build anticipation. Sure, whatever, okay. So leave this in the recording, put a code in the video and offer Amazon gift cards to people that crack the code. Sure. And you are, by the way, how did you tape a phone under my desk without me? What the? Okay. Um, so throughout this video, there's going to be some letters or emojis on the screen. Uh, that's going to be some kind of code. I'm not going to give any clues. Uh, see if you can crack it. And the prize is a 100 pound Amazon gift card. This is, uh, you can use this however you like. I would suggest putting it towards your education, buying revision guides, resources, things like that. But it's really going to be up to you. So again, there's going to be a code throughout this video. The first person to crack it wins the prize. Good luck.